Hello everybody. In this video, we are discussing model question paper 1 for third year CVZ final semester paper 7. So your question paper consists of three mains. First one is define the following. Ten questions, two marks each. Second main, you have answered the following. Eight questions will be given, six to be answered, four marks each. And the last main consists of eight questions. You need to answer six of it and six marks each. Okay, so we'll begin with define the following. First question is water potential. So water potential is defined as the free energy of water molecules in pure solution to that of the water molecules in a solution. Now, the water potential can be denoted by a symbol called Psi W. So the water potential of water, pure water, is kept as zero. As we add solute to the water, it will re reduce the free energy of the molecules. So water potential is denoted by bars. Okay. So bars is the unit. So one bar is equal to 0 0.987 atmospheres. Okay. So water potential was coined and proposed by Slater and Taylor. So the water potential will always be negative for the solutions. Next question, vernalization. So we all know that the flowering of the plant is very, very much important. The reproductive phase is because of flowers. So we get crops, fruits, vegetables and all because of flowers. So the, there is a scientist by name Lysen Ko who came up with a treatment, okay, that is cold winter cold temperature treatment for the crops. He did it with wheat, rice and rye. Okay. So what he did was he took the spring variety. Okay. So there is two varieties. One is the summer variety and the spring variety. Summer varieties is an annual crop whereas the spring variety is the biannual crop. So what Sir uh, Lesson Co did was he subjected the spring variety of rice for 0 to 5 degree temperature okay so when the plant was exposed for 0 to 5 degree of temperature they started to flower in the summer season of that particular year in the sense the spring variety was also converted into annual crop so this treatment would save the time that is instead of two years waiting for the harvest we can get the harvest in a single year so that was done by Lysenko. So the next uh, question is phototrophism. Phototrophism, it is the response given by the plants for the stimuli. What stimuli? A unidirectional source of light. So we all know that plants exhibit few responses, okay, for the external stimuli. This particular phototrophism, you can see the light, for the light, the plant is going to respond in three types. First one is they're going to show a positive approach towards the light. So we know that the stem or the leaves of the plant, stem of the plant will tend to grow towards the source of light. So that is towards the so source of light. Hence it is called as positive phototrophism. Talking about the roots, they grow away from the sunlight. So that is negative trophism. Negative phototrophism. What about the leaves? The leaves are perpendicular to the stem. So they don't tend to go down or upward. So we say they show transverse phototrophism. Okay. The next question is nodulation. Nodulation. Now the leguminous plants are the ones which show this particular feature. That is the root is being forming into knots. So what is this nodulation? How is it occurring? So the growth, uh, the plants, the leguminous plants are going to uh, produce growth factors. So when the roots has been accumulated with growth factors, the rhizobium bacteria comes around the, around the root which consists of these growth factors. So hence the root hairs will show a slight bend. And this bend will cause an injury at the tip of the root. Since there is an injury at the tip of the root, the rhizobium bacteria 
will send through the infectious, uh, infectious threads through that injury. And that infectious threads will reach into the uh, endodermis and pericycle of the cells of the root hairs and they allow or start the cell division. So they trigger the cell division. There is numerous of cells being formed and they swell and increase in size. Then the rhizobium bacteria will enter inside and they will also enlarge and become rhizoids which will which is ready to take up nitrogen fixation. Next moving on to thigmotrophism. Thigmotrophism is again a response given by the plants for external factor which is the factor the touch. The touch is the factor here. So now we know that the plants that is especially the creepers climbers are the ones which show thigmotrophism. So they say that the plants is capable of identifying the surface if it is smooth or rough. So these cre uh, creepers or climbers are very weak plants. They need a support to climb onto. So when you consider a sub supporting substance, maybe a stick or rod or whatever it is, as soon as the creepers, I mean the climbers recognizes the support system, they tend to grow towards it. Okay, so this is growing towards it and the surface which is touching the stick, okay, the surface which is touching the stick will show minimum growth whereas the surface away from the stick will show maximum growth and they, as the growth is extending here, the climbers are going to curl onto the stick. So, uh, the uh, phenomenon that is the touch, what is the variation occurring inside the cell? So, there can be ionic variations, there can be uh, water intake variations, they can, this is the reason wherein the protoplasm of the cell will show some variation wherein they are going to start to bend and curl onto the stick. The same phenomenon occurs with the tendrils. So they say that the plant can recognize the touch within 30 seconds of coming in contact to each other. Next, moving on to the next question. It is anti-transparence. So anti-transparence is quite opposite to transpiration wherein we are reducing the amount of water lost by the aerial parts of the plant. So what are these anti-transparents? The substances which is utilized to prevent transpiration. For example, they say that silica, thin plastic, less viscosity wax, etc. can be used as the anti-transparent. So what happens is we are going to smear the leaf with the wax or cover it with a thin film of plastic, etc. when the stomata will reduce I mean the stomata will close down and there is reduction in transpiration. So they say that this anti-transpirance will not cause any kind of growth inhibitions in the plant. Next moving on to the gutation. Gutation is again loss of water but it is in the form of liquid. So the exudation of water from the plant body in the form of liquid is called as gutation. Next, moving on to vegetative propagation, it is the growth of plant, a new individual from the vegetative part of a plant. That is maybe the stem, the root or the leaf. Here, the seed production doesn't occur. Without producing seeds from the plant body parts, we are going to get new individual which will be similar to that of the parent plant. Next, moving on to alcoholic fermentation. Fermentation, alcoholic fermentation comes under aerobic respiration. But for aerobic and uh, anaerobic, sorry, it comes under anaerobic respiration. For aerobic and anaerobic respiration, glycolysis is the first step. So what exactly happens is the glucose molecule will undergo glycolysis. Okay, so the glucose molecule undergoes glycolysis to form pyruvic acid okay so glucose molecule is six carbon compound pyruvic acid is two car uh, sorry three carbon compound okay 
So one molecule of glucose will break into two molecules of pyruvic acid plus two molecules of NADH2 plus two molecules of ATP molecule. So this is glycolysis. After glycolysis, the pyruvic acid, this is common for aerobic and aero, anaerobes. We are talking about fermentation, so it is about anaerobic respiration. So pyruvic acid will be converted into two aldehyde compound. Okay, so then this will be converted into two ethyl alcohol. Why? There is no presence of oxygen here. The, uh, here there is renewal of carbon dioxide molecule. Okay. Decarboxylation is a process. Here the process is fermentation and here it is glycolysis. Okay. Next, moving on to the last question of the first main. Hydrases enzyme with example. So, hydrases comes under the enzyme classification wherein they are helping in removal or addition of, of a water molecule. So, the example is malic acid. Okay. So, the conversion of malic acid into fumaric acid. So, what happens is malic acid will be converted into fumaric, fumaric acid plus a water molecule by an enzyme called fumarase. So this fumarase is a hydrase enzyme wherein the malic acid will be converted into fumaric acid with the liberation of water molecule. So water mo molecule is being removed out. So that's the reason we put these under the category as hydrases enzyme. Next, moving on to the second main, answer the following. First question is ascent of sap. Ascent of sap. So it is the movement of water from the root system to the shoot system of the plant. So it is movement of water against the gravitational force. That's the reason we call it as ascent of sap. So, how are you going to explain ascent of sap? So, the root hairs, okay, the root hairs is the first primary contact of the plant to the soil. So, what happens is, there are soil molecules, there are thin film of water moving, or moving between the soil molecules, yes. So, what happens is, the simple osmosis occurs. The water from the soil molecules which is between them, the water film will enter into the root hairs. So root hairs will send the water to the root xylem. Okay. So from the root hair, water is sent to xylem. We know xylem, xylem are the water conducting tissue of plants. They can be of different components in it. They can be of xylem trachids or xylem vessel. And there will be present of xylem parenchyma, xylem fibers in, in the xylem uh, vessel of the plant. So we know that since they are xylem trachids or vessels which are tubular structure, they are going to run tube, tube lights throughout the plant body. So from the root xylem, the water will be taken up by the stem xylem. Okay. Stem xylem. From the stem, it's going to reach to the midrib. Midrib of leaf. Sorry. Midrib of leaf. From the midrib of leaf, it is going to enter into the, all the cells. Cells of the leaf. So, the cells that is which consist of chloroplast that is palisade parenchyma and spongy parenchyma will take up the water from the cells where they are going to carry out a very important phenomenon that is photosynthesis. Now ascent of sap is nothing but upliftment of water from the soil to the tip of the shoot system by against the gravitational force. So this upliftment of water can be explained with few theories, okay? TCT theory, 
the physical theory, the root pressure theory. So the physical theory is the one which I'm going to explain here. They say that the water consists of two quality. One is cohesive and adhesive property. So the water content, if you take it in a tumbler, that is in a glass, you will find that water to be as a unimolecule like structure. Okay, unimolecule like you will see it because they don't split up into different parts. So entire glass will have water. So that is called adhering. They are cohesive. All the water molecules will adhere together and they are going to stick to the vessel. So same property is impl in implied here also. So the water molecules will stick to the xylem and due to certain pressure, that is the transpiration pull or transpiration will make the water to be pulled upward against the gravitational force and it will be supplying to each cells of the plant body. So this is called as ascent of sap. Next, moving on to the next question, you have hydrophonics. What are hydrophonics? So, growing of plants without soil. We come across many criteria. Nowadays, we know that the agricultural land is minimum and the product we want is maximum. So, that is not possible when you talk about the agricultural lands. So, we are trying to innovate. We are trying to bring in new technologies. So, there are two types which is successfully practiced even today that is hydrophonics and aerophonics so hydrophonics is growing of the plants on water or in the waters i mean on water without soil so there are big concrete tanks which are built okay i'm just drawing the um, above surface okay aerial surface so if this is a concrete tank they are going to supply to you tubes for the tank wherein there is always an inlet of water and outlet of water occurring. So there is the tank, concrete tank built on which there will be mesh. Okay. So they are going to put meshes on the tank and they will grow plants in each spot. That is each squares. So how is this occurring? So the water which is in the tank will be provided with all the nutrient, required nutrient. Now we can't be telling the soil will have all the nutrient. We don't know which part of the soil. We will take soil profile, we'll study about it. But we can't say how much is being utilized by the plant and how much is spending. But here the uh, complete nutrient which is required will be given to the plant in the form of liquid. So the there is a continuous inlet wherein... Um, frequently you keep changing the water because the plants is going to take up the nutrients and there is complete aeration uh, mechanical aeration is done because the plant even needs oxygen okay so what they do is there is aeration occurring and there is plants which is grown on it the plants will take up the nutrients and they'll grow the unwanted water will be sent out from the other side Okay, so hydrophonics is growing of plants on water without soil in it. Okay, so the next one is explain glycolysis. Glycolysis. Glycolysis, as I said, uh, uh, it is the respiration of the uh, respiration of organisms. Any organisms, be it the plant or animal, they take up uh, respiration where the glucose molecule will be broken down to give energy. So glucose is a 6 carbon compound. Glucose is a 6 carbon compound. And this glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of mitochondria. So glycose with the help of few enzymes they undergo breakage. And, we'll, and, and the end product you'll get is pyruvic acid. So we'll see how it is occurring. So glucose, glucose molecule will be converted into glucose 6-monophosphate by an enzyme called hexokinase. Okay? So there is a util utilization of an ATP molecule 
into ADP. One phosphate group will be taken from adenosine triphosphate and will form glucose 6 monophosphate. Another enzyme called isomerase will help in conversion of 6, I mean glucose 6 phosphate into fructose 6 monophosphate. Monophosphate. Okay. So this fructose 6 monophosphate will combine with an inorganic phosphate. That is ATP molecule will release an phosphate group and it will join to the fructose. So it will come convert into fructose 1 6 diphosphate by an enzyme called phosphofructokinase. Okay. So here, this all molecules are six carbon compounds. Okay. All these are six carbon compounds. There are here, henceforth, it will undergo cleavage. Okay. So, six carbon compound will break into three carbon compound. Okay. So, it is done by an enzyme called allose, allase, the ASE. Okay. Allase enzyme. So, what are the compound? Here you will find dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Here it is three phosphate. Glyceraldehyde. These both are three carbon compounds. This three phosphoglyceraldehyde will be converted into one comma three phosphoglyceric acid. Okay, by an enzyme called Kinase. Okay. Here, NAD molecule will be reduced into NADH2. Okay. So then, um, sorry, diphosphate. Because there is two phosphate group adding on. This 1 comma 3 diphosphoglyceric acid will be converted into 3 di 3 Phosphoglyceric acid. Okay. So, 3 phosphoglyceric acid. This 3 phosphoglyceric acid will undergo rearrangement. Rearrangement by an enzyme called Mutase. Sorry. Here it is kinase enzyme helping. Here it is dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase. Okay. So mutase will help in uh, changing the carbon compound from uh, 3 position to 2 position. So, this phosphoglyceric acid will be converted into 2 phosphoenol pyruvic acid by an enzyme called enolase. Okay. And the last step is this phosphoenol pyruvic acid will convert into py pyruvic acid. Okay, they will be converted into pyruvic acid, which is a three carbon compound, okay, by kinase enzyme. So, what happens here? There is a conversion. Here, an ADP molecule will form into ATP molecule, okay. So same process occurs here. So here there is a 
diphosphate. One phosphate is removed off. So ADP molecule will take up an inorganic phosphate and forms ATP molecule. So as I said, the entire process is same for the other compound also. So the entire glycolysis consists of 10 ATP molecules. How is it? We will calculate now. So first thing is there is usage of two ATP molecules. Whereas here, there is formation of NADH2 molecule. One, one side I am talking about, the other side we have not done. So one NADH2 molecule will give rise to three ATP molecules. Three plus three, six. Six, you have one seven. So here also you will get one eight. You have one nine and you have one ten. So and by the process of glycolysis, okay. Glycolysis. By the process of glycolysis, there is 10 ATP molecules which is produced and of, out of which 2 ATP molecules are used. So the total number you will get is 8 ATP molecules with 1, one molecule of glucose. The next question is describe terminal oxidation. Terminal oxidation is the oxidation of FAD and NAD molecules in presence of oxygen to release energy is called as terminal oxidation. This occurs in uh, the rachis particle of mitochondria. So the first is the substrate A. Okay. So hydrogen is removed from the substrate A and transferred to the molecule NAD. So the NAD get reduced into NADH2. So this hydrogen molecule is further reducing another molecule called the FAD. So FAD gets reduced into FADH2. Okay. So in main process, there is a formation of an ATP molecule. Okay. So ADP combines with an inorganic phosphate to get ATP molecule. So after FAD, the molecule, uh, the hydrogen will be transferred to the acceptor, uh, proton acceptor that is ubiquinone. So ubiquinone gets the proton in it. Okay. So after this, it has been the hydrogen splits. Okay. The hydrogen splits into two photons and an elect two electrons. Okay. So these electrons will be carried on by cytochromes. So these cytochromes are cytochrome A, B, C and A3. Okay. So the next we move on to the cytochromes. First is cytochrome B. Cytochrome B, then, then cytochrome C, from cytochrome C to cytochrome A. Okay, to cytochrome A. And lastly to cytochrome A3. Okay. So, goes up, comes down, comes down and then goes up. So, what I said, there is the splitting of hydrogen molecule where from the ubiquinone there is splitting of hydrogen molecule. Photons and two electrons will be split and given into cytoplasm. So this two electrons, two electrons will be transported by this cytochrome. So how many electrons? Two electrons. So this hydrogen will combine with half of water, that is half of oxygen, because only one atom is required, and it will give out. H2O water is released. Meantime, there is production of ATP molecule where 
after cytochrome B once and after cytochrome C once. Okay, so there is a ATP molecules produced here. How? And ADP molecules, ADP molecules will take up inorganic phosphate. Two ADP will take up an inorganic phosphate and there will be production of two. So there is three ATP molecules being produced at one at one point of at one one electron transport chain. Okay. So that is a hydrogen from the substrate one uh, two hydrogens will be taken up so oxidation occurs so it is getting the nad molecules is reducing into h2 h2 so h2s are the protons which is transported ubiquinone is a proton acceptor it takes up protons and then the proton splits up into two elect two photons and two electrons so this photon is being combined with the water molecule oxygen to form a water molecule which will be released along with the cytochromes B, C, A, A3. Four of them will transport an electron. So this is terminal oxidative chain. The next question. The next question is, what is geotrophism illustrate? Okay, with a theory. One theory you can give that. So geotrophism, again, talking about trophism, it is the response to an external stimuli so geo means it is because of gravity so the plants what response it is showing through uh, to the gravity so we all know the shoots shows negative geotrophism because it is growing against the gravity of the earth it grows straight up whereas the roots show positive geotrophism as it goes uh, into the earth's crust deeper deeper it seeps it so the positive uh, gravity uh, geotrophism is shown by the roots. The negative geotrophism is shown by the shoot system, the stem. And the leaves shows diegeotrophism because they are not bending towards the ground, gravity or away from the ground. But they stand perpendicular to the stem. So that is called as, that is called as uh, uh, diegeotrophism. Next, they have asked you to give one theory of geotrophism. So theory, we will take, uh, talk about starch stalolith theory. So what exactly this theory says is that the starch starch molecules, the amyloplast, okay, they consist of starch grains, which is uh, uh, not with a regular size. It is unsymmetrical molecules. So what happens is this starch molecules are, are showing response to gravity. So if this is the cell, Okay, the root cell, root hair. What exactly happens is the starch molecule, stalolith, okay, star stalolith will be there in the tip of the plant cell. Now, gravity means we are talking about towards the earth's surface. So what happens, this stalolith grains or stalolith, star stalolith, will respond to gravity and it tends to move downwards. Okay. When the star stalolith move downwards, there is the production of auxin. Auxin is a growth hormone which will be produced at the lower base itself, below the star stalolith. Since there is auxin here, the cell division occurs and the growth is maximum here whereas it is minimum on the above surface so when the growth is occurring at the lower surface what happens the root will tend to bend downward okay so what happens because of oxygen which is present here it makes the roots to bend so they say the starch stalolith nothing but the starch grains in the amyloplast will show response to gravity and it will bend towards down that's the reason root will bend and go down to the earth's crust okay so that is about the geotrophism moving on to this next question is describe photoperiodism so what is photoperiodism photo means light periodism is the duration the light's duration 
So we all know that the plants are very much, very much in need of sunlight. Okay, so plants is very much in need of sunlight. So the plants will start to flower when they are in the proper phase, proper phase of sunlight. So we can say that there is a photo period. Photo period is the duration of duration of time wherein the sunlight should be available for the plant. So this photo period is varied according to different plants. Okay. So based on that, we are going to classify the photo period as a plants into four types. One is short day plant. Second is long day plant. Third is intermediate plant. And the fourth one is day neutral plant. So short day plants are the plants which will have a critical phase, critical period. Critical period means it is the optimum period of time wherein the sunlight should be available. If the plants which has the critical period below that, that is within that critical period, if the light, light period should be available for the plants, then we call it as short day plants. For example, the violet flask. Violet requires around 11 hours of sunlight. So they will have 11 hours of sunlight and the remaining 24 hours, the remaining will be the darkness. So what happens, for example, if you consider 6, 12, 24, 19, okay, 18 or 19. So when you consider it is 11 hours, so somewhere around, okay, so somewhere like it is about, this is the span of photoperiodism, light period required for the plant. The remaining, which is the maximum phase, is darkness. When the plant has been subjected for short, short period of time for light and dark period, a large space or time for the darkness, they are called as short day plants. Then only they will flower. In case, in the darkness, all of a sudden there is a light period, a flashlight which is coming up. Then the plant will never flower. Okay. So that is called short day plant or you can also call it as long night, long night plants, long night plants because they require long night darkness and short light, okay, short period of light. The second one is the same way around you have the long day plants. In this, the period of light should be maximum, maximum in the sense maximum, more than the critical period. So when you talk about more than critical period, example, the spinach requires around 18 hours of light. So when you talk about 18 hours of light, it is nearly the maximum. Okay, 6, 12, 18, 24. So you can see they require maximum daylight or sunlight and they require very less, very less night darkness. Okay. So this is called as long day plants. Okay. They are called as the long day plants. This is the short day plants. Okay. Now, what are these uh, intermediate plants? So this intermediate plants are the few plants which requires long day, short night or it is like they need a short day and long night. So they are called as long short day plants wherein they require less light energy or it is called as short long day plants wherein it require maximum light energy. So that is called the intermediate plants. Talking about the last one, neutral plants. Neutral plants doesn't, they are not dependent on the light period, photo period. Either day or night, they are not uh, based, they don't require much of, they are not interfering much. Okay. So they do not, uh, the light will not interfere much into their flowering habit. Okay. What happens is, the if there is five hours of light, that's sufficient. Five hours of light and remaining darkness also it's okay. Or if it is a continuous illuminated phase also is okay. So this plants will either bother if there is long day or short day. They don't bother. But they require 
few period that is few photo periods so that they take up photosynthesis etc and carry on their metabolic rates whereas the flowering is not dependent on the light or darkness that is called as neutral day plants next moving to the next question mm. next question is transpiration and its type so we know what is transpiration is the aerial from the aerial part of the plant the loss of water is called as transpiration so the loss of water from the aerial parts of the plant is called as transpiration it occurs in different forms where cuticular uh, transpiration stomatal transpiration and lenticular transpiration so this is the region based on the region they have given you the types for the region in the sense the cuticular region that is the leaf will be covered with the cuticle so if there is a waxy layer still the transpiration occurs through the cuticle then it is called as cuticular transpiration the stomatal transpiration cuticular transpiration very less amount of water will be lost whereas the stomatal transpiration there is maximum loss of water how is it because there are plenty numbers of stomata present at the lower surface of the plant as well as few number of stomata present on the upper surface of the leaf so this leaf uh, both the surface will account to the complete tra uh, transpiration of water that is loss of water in the vapor forms that is the stomatal transpiration Ca talking about the third one that is the lenticular transpiration the old trees the bark of the trees will have openings on their barks okay so old trees on the bark they'll have small openings which is called lenticels so through this lenticels whatever transpiration occurs is called as is called as lenticular transpiration and the amount of water loss is also less compared to that of the stomata next moving on to the last question that is munch hypothesis so munch hypothesis it was ernest munch who proposed this hypothesis okay so what it is based on it is based on the uh, on the fact that translocation of food how the movement of food occurs in the plant body so what he did was he demonstrated it with the help of a small experiment so what was it he took two two apparatus connected to both by a bent tube okay with the help of bent tube he connected the both the apparatus okay he named it as a b and c okay he placed this tubes in a trough containing water okay so the trough contains water trough is filled with water so the entire trough is filled with water and the apparatus b is filled with water okay so in the a in the a e kept sugar solution so sugar solution was present in a now what is translocation of food in plants how is it occurring it is the movement of the uh, food that is the glucose produced by the plant from the leaf to the different parts of the plant so he said this is the source source is the place where the food is produced and he said this is the sink okay So say A, A is the source, and this is the sink. It is transported by this bent tube, bent tube, which is C. So now, how this transportation occurred because of osmosis. Okay, so concentration here is high. So what happens? They started moving towards the region where there is low concentration of sugar. so the sugar solution started to started to move to the sink unless and until 
equilibrium was attained equilibrium was attained okay and the other thing is there is an n mass flow from here the complete thing is moving towards the right okay so it is called n mass in mass in mass means in bulk they are moving from in the bulk the sugar solution from here is moving towards the b where it, they are going to there there it's going to continue unless and until equilibrium is attained the concentration is maintained okay so that is called the munch hypothesis wherein he says from source from the source from the source it is moving to the sink through the phloem tissue so he says this is the leaf this can be the fruit or the root etc and this is the phloem tissue so he says it is moving but one thing was a failure because it couldn't show a unidirectional motion okay it is only one uh, the movement is only in one direction it doesn't go reverse in phloem so that was not been uh, not been explained by this particular experiment and that was the demerit de demerit of that experiment next moving on to the next uh, main that is answer the following six marks each the first question is sigmoid curve so we all know growth is a common or a very regular phenomenon in all living organism so growth of a tissue or an organ or a plant takes up in a regular similar pattern so that pattern is being plotted on to a graph okay so on the graph in the sense against the time so one okay so the y axis consists of growth growth like this and this is the time where it goes like this okay so the growth of the plant or the tissue or the organ whatever it is shows a particular particular symbol like okay so it looks like s shape that's the reason it gets the name sigmoid curve so what are the different regions here in the curve there is a lag face there is a log face there is a decline face and there is a senescence phase okay so what is this lag phase lag phase is the starting point of growth the actual phase where the momentum is just starting okay they are starting to grow so it shows a very less rate of growth it's just starting to grow then the plants enters into log phase log phase is the region where maximum growth occurs okay the rate of growth is maximum and the plant tries to grow completely then coming to the decline phase where in the phase at which the plant growth slows down after it finishes growing completely and it starts to slow down so the rate of growth is very less and last phase is the senescence phase wherein the growth is completely stopped so this is being plotted out by uh, on the graph wherein growth is being plotted against the time and you can see a s s shaped that's the reason we call it as sigmoid curve the next question is explain krebs cycle so krebs cycle was given by sir hans krebs he was awarded nobel prize for this and uh, krebs this particular mechanism occurs in the matrix of mitochondria this is the st third step in respiration among the aerobes okay so what happens is after decarboxylation process the acetyl coa will enter into krebs cycle will combine with oxaloacetic acid which is a four carbon compound so 2 plus 4 six carbon uh, compound krebs uh, citric acid is formed so this krebs cycle can also be krebs cycle can also be called as citric acid cycle so what happens is there is a removal of a water molecule and citric acid will be converted into cis acetic acid which is again a six carbon compound it will take up a water molecule 
and will form into isocitric acid, which is a six carbon compound. Now, the NAD molecule is reduced into NADH2 molecule and then you will find oxaloacetic acid to be formed, which is again a six carbon compound. Since there is a liberation of carbon dioxide, the six carbon compound will be converted into five carbon compound that is alpha ketoglutaric acid. This alpha ketoglutaric acid will again release a carbon molecule. Uh, carbon will combine with oxygen and released as carbon dioxide and if NAD molecule is reduced into NADH2 molecule and there is the formation of succinyl-CoA. Succinyl-CoA is a four carbon compound since one carbon is removed off from alpha glutaric acid. This succinyl-CoA will again uh, take up water molecule. One inorganic phosphate will combine with GDP to form G GTP molecule and there is liberation of carbon dioxide and there is succinic, sorry, succinic acid being formed. This succinic acid will reduce the FAD molecule to FADH2 molecule and fumaric acid will be formed which is again a four carbon compound. One molecule of water will combine with fumaric acid to form a malic, malic acid. This malic acid will reduce NAD molecule into NADH2 and there is an oxaloacetic acid being formed. So this is the oxaloacetic acid which combines with acetyl-CoA and convert into a citric acid. So this Krebs cycle is wherein we are going to study how much ATP molecules is being produced. So if it is, if NAD molecule, NADH2 is molecule is being produced in the sense there is two ATP molecules produced, sorry, three ATP molecules produced. Then you have uh, your one more, so three ATPs. Uh, GTP will produce one ATP molecule, FAD will produce two ATP molecule and again your three ATP molecule, okay. So we are talking about gluco uh, glycolysis afterwards uh, you have a decarboxylation reaction and then the acetyl-CoA has been coming. So we are talking about only a single molecule of acetyl-CoA wherein one single molecule will produce 3 plus 3, 6, 7, 8, 9 and plus 3, 12 ATP molecules. So one acetyl-CoA is producing 12 ATPs. So two molecules will produce how much? 24 ATPs is produced in one Krebs in Krebs cycle. Okay, so Krebs cycle will produce 24 ATPs when two molecules of acetyl CoA is being uh, is being reduced and converted into this following things. Okay, so the next question, moving to the next question, is mechanism of stomatal movement. So, we all know that stomata consists of guard cells. Yes, guard cells is in adjacent to the epidermal cells. Okay, so they are in adjacent to epidermal cells. So, the epidermal cells and guard cells are the ones which is responsible for opening and closing of stomata. Now, how is it occurring? So, we can study the uh, mechanism of stomata in two theories. First is the starch sugar interconversion theory okay so starch sugar interconversion theory and the next one is photon transport theory so what exactly happens here is there is an enzyme called starch phosphorylase which helps in conversion of starch into sugar now during daytime during daytime, the plants, due to respiration, takes up carbon dioxide. Okay? So, carbon dioxide will, take, will be used up by photo, photosynthesis. Okay? So, there is the increase in pH. Sorry. So, the pH is increased. So what happens when the pH is increased, the starch is converted into 
sugar by the enzyme okay so which is the enzyme starch phosphorylase okay so when the sugar is being formed the water potential decreases when the water potential decreases from the epidermal cells okay from the epidermal cells the guard cells will be closed okay so the guard cells are closed from the epidermal cells okay i'm just giving an outline so from the epidermal cells water is taken in since water potential in the guard cell is less okay water potential is less from the epidermal cell water is entering into guard cell once the water enters in the guard cell the guard cell become turgid turgid and once it is turgid it will open okay once it is turgid the guard cell opens what happens during the night time there is no conversion there is no conversion of carbon dioxide into uh, into the uh, glucose molecule so uh, for no photosynthesis so what happens carbon dioxide will combine with water to form to form photons plus h2 carbonic ions okay h2 co3 ions so this h2 co3 ions will bring sorry photons the photons will bring down the ph level okay so photons is added on so ph level will de decrease and since the ph level is decreased what happens is the sugar is converted into starch so since sugar is converted into starch starch will not alter much okay so what happens the water potential is high only so the starch is not bringing down the water potential so since the water potential is high there is no endosmosis here endosmosis occurs whereas here there is no endosmosis exosmosis occurs and what happens is the turgid cell the turgid cell which is open will send the water outside and they will become flaccid flaccid in the sense they will close the stomata this is the starch sugar conver interconversion theory next we move on to the photon transport theory the photon transport theory what exactly happens here is during the day time during the day time okay during the day time there is the formation of starch molecule which converts which will form malic acid malic acid will break into photon and malate ion okay so this photons will move out of the cell if this is the cell photons will move out of the cell that is efflux of photons h plus and influx of potassium influx of potassium okay so influx of potassium and efflux of photon so what happens this photon will combine with malate to form potassium malate so this particular influx of photons will occur with the utilization of atp molecules and the photon channels okay the proton channel will be open and it's going to enter okay potassium malate is formed potassium malate will bring down the water potential so water potential once it is decreased what happens is endosmosis occurs endosmosis occurs so the water from the neighboring epidem epidermal cells will enter into stomata once it enters the stomata the cells become turgid turgid as they are turgid the cells will expand and the stomatal pore gets open so what happens in the night during night okay during night 
the carbon dioxide concentration is high. No photosynthesis doesn't occur, so carbon dioxide concentration is high, which in turn makes the pH value low. When the pH value is low, the photon channels, okay, the photon channels are blocked. So photon channels are blocked and there is no movement of water, etc. So the, the cells become flaccid and they close the pore. So that is about stomatal mechanism. Next, moving to the next question. Okay. The next question is, uh, write the chemical nature and advantages of auxins. So chemical nature of auxin. The first auxin crystallized form was got from the human urine by Skog C. A person called Skog C was first, first crystallized uh, auxin. So the artificial form of auxin is indole acetic acid. It is indole 3 acetic acid. Okay, so they have asked you the chemical nature. So you should be writing the chemical nature. There are different forms of auxins. Okay, so indole acetic acid, they are C13, H38, O5. Okay, so this is the molecular formula. So this is one O C H two C O O H. This is two N A A N A A. We have another one two forty six tri benzoic acid. That is. Another chlorine, yeah, another chlorine with C. With O, C, O, O, H molecule. Okay, so these are the few different artificial auxins. Okay, the next uh, part, second part is what are the applications of auxins? So the applications of auxins, you need to write, the first one is cell elongation. Okay, so this is the very, very important work of auxin. So what they do is they help in cell elongation. So they make the protoplasm, okay, plasma membrane of cell permeable for expanding. Second one is apical dominance. Apical dominance. So what is apical dominance? The uh, bud, the terminal bud of the, uh, of the plant will have auxin content there. So what the, uh, auxin accumulates at the apical bud and the lateral buds will be, will be suppressed. Okay, they won't grow. So what does the gardener do? He plucks off or he takes out the apical buds so that the lateral buds will grow well. So the auxins will help, uh, auxins are the ones which is taking up apical dominance. Okay. The next uh, function of uh, auxin, tissue culture. In tissue culture, auxins are used to initiate rooting. Okay. So the number of roots is also got is more. Then another function is synchronous flowering. So in the case of orchids, okay, the field will be, the plants will be sprayed with auxin. So this will make the flowering of all the orchids plant to flower at a particular time. Okay, so one at once the entire field will flower. So that is one of the application of auxin. So the other one is seed dormancy. In the case of potato seeds, okay, the auxin will prolong its dormancy whereas it will break the dormancy in the case of bulb and corms 
okay so the another function of uh, auxin is they act as a viricide so the echornia the water plants which is frequently uh, seen here and there they are they are the weeds okay so by by spraying auxin this particular echornia plants will be killed okay so that is one of the function of auxin so what are the function of auxin they are cell elongation apical dominance viricides okay they induce parthenocarpy what is parthenocarpy without reprodu uh, without fertilization without formation of seeds fruits are formed okay so the orange fruits where in grapes etc you see they are seedless so that is also by spraying auxin so parthenocarpy seed dormancy uh, synchronous flowering viricides etc so these all are functions of auxin the next question give the biosynthesis and uses of abscisic acid so biosynthesis of abscisic acid un, uh, undergoes in two uh, two ways okay two uh, synthesis one is the direct synthesis and the other one is indirect synthesis so direct synthesis occurs whenever the plant cell is under the water stress okay so uh, mevalonic acid will be converted into isopentanyl pyrophosphate which in turn will form into farnesyl pyrophosphate and then into abscisic acid the indirect synthesis is by oxidation and uh, reduction okay so what happens is the xanthin okay vile xanthin will cleave into c15 aldehyde xanthonin by an enzyme lip oxygenase so this will undergo oxidation this particular compound will undergo oxidation with the help of dehydrogenase dehydrogenation okay it undergoes uh, oxidation and it will form into abscisic acid this occurs in the bean plant okay so what are the uses of abscisic acid so a few uses are that this they inhibit the seed germination so the abscisic acid when it is sprayed onto the seeds they will stop germination once you wash it off they again germinate so that is the first application second application is they inhibit inhibit uh, bud flowering okay so what happens in the woody trees and woody trees when they are sprayed with abscisic acid the lateral buds are will undergo dormancy they will not flower the third one is the abscisic acid will uh, will be able to produce or will be able to show geotrophism when the plants have been sprayed with abscisic acid they show positive geotrophism and the last one is that they are they are the ones which um, show senescence okay so abscission there is a thin dead layer cells being formed on uh, between the stem and the leaf or between the stem and the uh, fruit uh, stalk peduncle so what happens is once they are formed they will fall off the other thing is the stomata the closing and opening of stomata is also being uh, regulated by abscisic acid so when the abscisic acid is being produced they will reduce the transpiration and they will they will close the stomata hence they reduce the transpiration transpiration when there is water potential decrease in the in the cells that is water stress occurs in the cell the mesophyll cells uh, automatically the abscisic acid will disappear and the mesophyll cells will regulate as the regular ones okay so these are the applications of abscisic acid moving on to the next question uh what is grafting explain its type grafting is a type of vegetative propagation so we know that the vegetative propagation does not involve seed formation it is purely by the stem now grafting is done wherein we are taking two plants one will be the plant which is capable of rooting very well okay in a sense the plants which shows rooting they are the ones which is called as the stock plant okay so the plant which roots very well is considered as stock plant okay so they are the stock plant wherein they are cut above the earth surface few inches they are cut when they are cut 
and all over this we are going to place another plant okay so this becomes the stalk and this becomes the scion okay so the scion is the plant of desirable characters whereas the stalk is the one which has a well developed roots for absorption of water nutrients etc and the scion is the one which has the desirable character and the, once they are placed one above the other it is placed in a such a way that the xylem is in contact with each other and the cambium is also in contact with each other so like that they are placed and they are tied across okay they are tied and this will help the new plant that is the scion to grow flower and produce the fruits now grafting are of different types okay the first one is wedge grafting wedge grafting in this case the scion the plant scion will be cut in a shape of a wedge okay in a shape of a wedge they are cut and this this is the scion and this is the stalk so the stalk will contain a v shape cut okay so the stalk will contain a v shape cut and this scion is placed in such a way that this wedge will go and fix itself into the v shape cut and it will be tied with the grafting tape or a thread tightly okay so that is called wedge grafting the next one you have is bud grafting okay in the case of bud grafting we are going to take the stem of the plant we are going to make a horizontal section okay slightly cut horizontal and then a ventral cut a ventral cut will be a bit deeper a deeper cut in which we are going to place the bud okay so the bud will be placed in between okay the bud will be placed inside this bud will be placed inside the <coughs> vertical cut and the horizontal cut will help in keeping the bud intact okay so this two flap will cover this okay the flap that is the v shape flap will cover this and over this we are going to over this you are going to tie grafting tape or you can use the uh, simple thread and stapler i mean sorry the plaster okay so this is called as wedge grafting then you have another one is called as crown grafting okay the crown grafting occurs wherein the stalk is a big i mean bigger one okay the stalk the trunk is bigger the stem is bigger it's usually the tree which we do so the stalk is bigger and here we are going to make incisions okay there is a cuts being done in this stem okay so this stem cut will be this is the stalk and the scions will be a long a long sticks which has that v shape at the end okay so it's like this and here you are not going to put the grafting uh, plaster or tape anything here there is another thing called as grafting wax okay the grafting wax will be poured onto the surface okay so the entire surface will be covered with grafting wax so the stalk is bigger whereas the scions are smaller ones okay so this is called crown grafting okay then there is one more called as slant grafting okay slant grafting where it the stalk and the scions are cut in a slant fashion okay in a slant manner where it, they are going to come in contact with with each other you're going to fix it together and tie it up together okay that is called a slant grafting so in all these cases either they can be of different species from the same genus or different genus but they all in all these cases they should be in compatibility with one another okay especially with the 
uh, wedge grafting, slant grafting, etc. The xylem and cambium should be in contact. The stalk and the scion, both the xylem and cambium should be in parallel to one another. Okay, so that is about grafting. Next, moving on to um, write another question. Write the mode of actions of enzyme. So, it is the fissure was the person who first gave the lock and key mechanism of enzymes. Okay, what does this theory say? So, the theory states that every enzyme, okay, is is particular for its substrate. So, whatever sub substrate may be, it will have a particular enzymes for it. So, what happens is, this enzyme will have a particular active site. Okay. Um, so, for example, if this is the enzyme. Okay. If this is the enzyme. Okay. It is very particular for the substrate. So, the substrate should be, how the substrate should be? It should be like this. Complementing the enzyme. Okay. So, it should be like this. So, this becomes the substrate. Okay. So, uh, Fisher says that the active site, this particular region is called as active site. So, he says the active site will be complementing the substrate. Okay. So, they are similar. Just like the keys and the lock. You can't use different keys for a particular lock. A particular lock will be open only you, when you use a particular key. So, he says there are, they are very, very particular to each other. So, he says this substrate and enzyme will form an enzyme substrate complex. Okay. He says enzyme substrate complex is being formed. Okay. So it forms an enzyme substrate complex wherein the, this enzyme substrate complex, enzyme substrate complex is very unstable. Okay. They are not stable and immediately what happens? The substrate will break. Okay. So the substrate will break. Okay. You can say like this. Substrate will break and what happens? You will get you will get products. Okay. Something like this. Okay. So these are the products. Okay. Along with, along with the substrate which is going to stay as such without undergoing any changes. So this was the theory given by Fisher. Okay, so there was another person called Koshlan who modified this theory. What did he say? He said that the enzyme substrate, com enzyme substrate action, okay, the active site is not same for everything. So enzyme will be as such when it comes in contact to, to a substrate, it will change its active site and form the enzyme substrate complex for example if okay so this is the substrate so he says the enzyme can be of any form okay enzyme can be of any form okay so once uh, koshland says enzyme can be of any form but they are very particular for a substrate when, he, when the enzyme comes across the substrate, which is in particular, only uh, the uh, enzyme can act upon this particular substrate. When such, system, such scenario occurs, this enzyme will change its active state. Okay? It will change its active state in such a way that it's going to it's gonna complement the sub, substrate. Okay? So, what is the power shape? Okay. So, like this. Okay. So, this is the active site. This is the active site which is changed to match that substrate. 
So we say this as enzyme substrate complex. Okay. So enzyme substrate complex will be formed. Later on what happens is this will break down. Okay. This will break down into products. Okay. So we call it as products. And enzyme will get back to its normal stage. Okay. Enzyme will be getting back into normal stage. So enzyme substrate in Koshlan's uh, induce fit theory. Induce means it is inducing. It is putting itself into pressure so that it gonna take up the shape of what the substrate is. Okay. But still the substrate is very particular for that particular enzyme. Okay. That is the induced fit theory. The next question is TCT theory. Okay. TCT theory is tension cohesion theory. So this theory was given by Dixon and Jolly where they are talking about transportation of water from the roots to the, to the shoot system. So they say that again this consists of two theory of physical theories of water, physical qualities of water. One is hydrosyl and the other one is cohesion. Cohesion simply means the accumulation of all the water molecule into one big molecule. When you pour water from a jug into the glass, okay, it comes out as liquid together. It doesn't come in bits and pieces, okay. A drop also when it's raining, you can find a very definite shape for a drop, okay. We even draw like that. So this uh, cohesion theory makes the water molecule to move along the xylem as one particular molecule. The next one is adhesive theory, adhesive property. This adhesive property will make the water molecule to stick to the columns of xylem. Now xylem is a continuous tubular column which runs from the roots to the tip of the leaves. Okay, So when they are moving in columns, water also moves upward due to capillary action. Capillary action is wherein the cohesive water will adhere to the tubes and move along the tubes by some external force which is an external force that is the transpiration so whenever the leaf okay whenever whenever the leaf okay you know that there are stomatas at the leaf base which helps in transpiration so water is lost in the form of water vapor through stomata so what happens the stomatal chamber will have less water content that is water potential is low when the water potential is low in the chamber it in turn takes water from the spongy parenchyma so from the spongy parenchyma the water will move to the stomatal chamber so spongy parenchyma will in turn take water from the xylem xylem of the leaf that is the midrib or the veins okay uh, the uh, parallel veins or even for the matter reticulate veins so what happens from xylem the mesophyll cells will take water from a leaf xylem leaf xylem in turn will take water from the stem xylem from the stem xylem in turn the stem xylem will in turn take water from the root xylem so we all know that the xylem vessels the cortical cells, the endodermis, etc. All these cells will help in transportation of water. It is a chain process wherein the stomata, how much water is transpired, so much of water is in turn pulled by the plant. Okay. So the amount of water lost in the water vapor form is equal to the amount of water pulled by the plant. Now, this transpiration was explained by a simple uh, experiment by Dixon and Jolly. What did they do is they took a trough, trough of water, okay, they placed a capillary tube on which they placed a sponge which is dipped in water, okay, they placed the tube and sponge. So, a trough containing water, a tube, okay, on this they placed sponge, okay. The sponge had water as they exposed the, uh, the sponge towards sunlight evaporation occurs 
as evaporation occurs the water in the tube was absorbed by the sponge so there was continuous movement of water from the trough to the sponge through the tube so they say the tube is the xylem the uh, water or the uh, water or the trough is resembling the soil and the sponge are the mesophyll cells so this was a theory given by dixon and jolly so with that we finished the first model question